morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Michael. I'm happy to see you here on the second Sunday of Advent. Um, it is also Communion Sunday. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Um, if you would be so kind as to grab one of these folders in the pews and sign in if you're a member, it helps us to check in. And if you're a guest with us um, and you're willing to share some contact info, we'd just like to thank you for joining us. We promise we won't send you tons and tons of things in the mail or through your email. Do we have other announcements? Sure. <laughs> Always. Um, okay. Poinsettias, because I'm going to forget this if I don't say it first. Uh, if you'd like to order a poinsettia, they're $20, and you can use one of the little white tie envelopes in the pew and write down your name and how many you're going to get so that we can keep track of it all. Was that right? Okay. I did it okay? Okay. And then the, this Friday, we're going to have, well, yes. Question from the peanut gallery is, if we donate for a poinsettia, do we take it today or next Sunday, or when do we take it home? Uh, it would be on uh, Christmas Eve. Okay. So please donate, and they will okay. sit here lovingly, and then they will go home sure. mainly on Christmas Eve. Yeah. That, would that work Christmas Eve? Yeah. We just have to keep watering them so that they don't go. <laughs> Um, okay, and this Friday is our, our professional development day at Lincoln, so that means we're going to have the children here in the afternoon, and we are going to have so much fun. We're watching the Polar Express. They get tickets to come in and see the movie. They go down the railroad track. They're going to have popcorn. <sighs> it's going to be fun. And we're also on the 17th, we're doing the movie and pizza party, and Bob's interested in doing a euchre tournament. Aha, I remembered. So there's one to be had on the 17th. Um, Will, Thursday is food gatherers. We're all set. Yoo-hoo. OK, and <laughs> there's so many things. I have my cheat sheet. And then the Little White Church is out there. We're still collecting uh, for gifts for the staff. So if you have a donation that you'd like to put in the Little White Church for them, that would be really nice. And there will be a list going around just to let us know if you're planning on coming for pizza so that we know how many pizzas to get. I think I'm done. And for the movies, uh, if you didn't see the email that went out, um, we have a, a quite a large selection to choose from, including uh, some old favorites, the Charlie Brown Christmas and several of the Rankin and Bass uh, productions that are claymation and animation, um, and then some more recent ones. So we will have quite a, quite a variety to work with. Anybody got anything else for the good of the cause? All right. Well, that is some of the ministry, the business, and the fun that we do here. Um, I'd like to invite you to turn your hearts and minds towards a time of worship, and I'm going to turn things over to Teresa and Tammy and our praise band. Hear these words from the first chapter of the book of Luke on how the birth of Jesus was foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, 
and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mary, Mary, do you hear? Mary, Mary, do not fear. Who is there? Who is there? This voice in darkness so I'm so What is this message now that you impart? Fear not, Mary, O favor chosen one. The Lord is with you, and you shall bear a son, son of the highest. Jesus is his name, exalted his kingdom, and this is his reign. Magnify his name. 
be the servant of the Lord. In our opening prayer, O Root of Jesse, O peace, stir up your power within us, that in this time we may await with abundant expectation the fulfillment of your eternal presence in creation. For you live and reign among us, maker, saver, and giver of life, one God, now and forever. Amen. We bear fruit worthy of our repentance when we give our tithes and offerings for the well-being of the poor and all those that God calls us to be in ministry with. If you would please uh, rise as you are able, join in our doxology, which is on page 95 in the hymnal. give you thanks, Holy One, for all good things, for this universe and for earth itself, for creatures and plants, for water and food, for light and darkness, for Jesus, our brother, who enlarged our vision, setting himself before us as the bread and wine of abundant life, and for the Holy Spirit who comes to us in baptism and moves in our midst with the power to lead us to you. Turn our offerings to your good will and turn us always to you in gratitude. Amen. You may be seated, and it is now a time for God's children. 
like to invite any of our children and youth to come up and join me. And remember, you are all children of God, so y'all can come up. All y'all. Well, good morning, guys. How you guys doing? Bad. Bad, actually. Good morning, Bad. All right. So, do you remember what our word is for this month, our faith word? Oh, yes. What is it? Nope. Oh, it's a new one. Sorry. So, your new faith word, see, so you wouldn't have known it is hope, like we hope Pastor Michael can get his act together this morning. So, what does hope mean? Oh, yes. What do you think hope means? Hope means like I hope I win a race. So, like something that you are wanting to happen. Yeah. Okay, what, 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 what do you think? Okay. And then you're all entitled for it. Oh, okay. Do you have that one? No. Okay. So, do you guys know, what do you think? Why is Jesus' birth so special? What do you think? Is it because he was a nice guy? Or because on his birthday we get presents at Christmas? I don't know. No, Jesus' birth was so special because of what he was going to do. He was the promise that God had made to the people a long time ago that he would make things better and he would save everybody. So I want to read you a story called Mary's Joy. And focus. Here's Mary, and this is an angel who's coming to talk to her. All right. Mary lived in the town of Nazareth. Mary was engaged to marry Joseph, a builder whose family lived in Bethlehem. One day an angel appeared to Mary. At first, Mary was scared, but the angel Gabriel spoke to her, saying, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is pleased with you. I have come to tell you good news. God is going to send you a baby boy. You will name him Jesus. He is God's son. He will show everyone how to love God and each other. Mary listened closely, and her heart was filled with joy. I am a servant of God. I will do what God wants me to do, Mary said. So Mary's heart was filled with joy. I wonder, what what makes you guys joyful? Yeah, what makes you joyful? So when our friends and, and, and family come to visit, yeah? Okay, what makes you joyful? Uh, for being nice to people and wanting them to play with me. When people are nice and play with you and stuff? Okay. Anybody else? What makes you guys joyful? I win more. Okay, what else makes you joyful? That, uh, that people be nice to me and I'll show being around the back so I can be crazy. Okay. All right, can you guys join me in a repeat after me prayer? You guys ready? Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus and messages of hope. Amen. 
All right, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer in a little bit later during communion so you guys can go off to Sunday school. But, oh, yeah, I'm getting there. Hold on. Okay, you don't have to have one. Yes, and just remember, when you're going back to Sunday school, we're doing walking feet, okay? We're not going to run. Okay, thanks, guys. All right, and we will continue uh, in our service with hymn number 236. We're going to use verses 1 through 3 and then jump to verse 6. Uh, this is while shepherds watched their flocks. <laughs> Now is the time that we lift before God and God's people the things that may be weighing upon our hearts and our minds, but also those things that give us cause for great joy. Do we have any joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Oh, this is a fun one. The uh, dramatic arts program at Lincoln are in good hands based upon what the elementary school children did in their production of The Jungle Book. Uh, AJ and uh, Dee were in it, and it was the cutest production you've ever seen, the costuming, the scenery. Any of you that went to Lincoln, that auditorium is the same as when we were there. They've only replaced the seat with the cushions, and we don't get slivers when we sit on them anymore. But it was wonderful. They did a great job. Our sister-in-law, Robin Zufall, is um, dealing with cancer right now. She's had her third chemo treatment and her hair's all gone. And that's really hard for her because she had glorious hair, absolutely beautiful. So she's in good spirits, but she's kind of dealing with that change in her identity. And I just, a praise note for the praise band today. That was absolutely wonderful. I just wanted to thank everybody uh, who uh, 
had their prayers for my sister-in-law, Cynthia, who finally got out of Reddy's rehab last, this last Friday, and she's back at her house. Uh, I'm not too happy about it, because it's a long way off where the Selene wasn't so good, but, uh, I mean, Selene was better, but not up there. But uh, she is doing well, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll keep her in your prayers until she completely re rehabs. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any others? Okie dokie. This morning for our, our prayers, um, I invite you to join me when I say the words, hear us, O God. Uh, I invite you to respond, if you wish, with the words, your mercy is great. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. Is great. We come to you this day, O oh God, with a deepening anticipation of your birth among us. We thank you for the gift of your love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the church throughout the world and for all the ministries that build up the body of Christ, that in our many vocations we may serve to your glory. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for this nation and for all nations, remembering especially those who are victims of political and social injustice. We pray for elected officials and all leaders that they will govern with courage and equity. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for all in need, for the sick, the destitute, and the dying, for strangers in our land, for the invisible ones, for the elderly and children, for parents and grandparents, for those who live alone and those who live lonely in the midst of family. This morning we especially lift up Robin in her continuing battle with cancer, and we lift up Cynthia and pray that she will continue to heal throughout her rehab. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. We remember with mercy those who sleep without shelter, cold and vulnerable, lacking enough food, those who are overworked, and those who have no work. Stir up in us the capacity to see ourselves in their struggles and to act so that others may have life abundant. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. We pray for this community, for our neighbors and friends, and for those with whom we study and work. Guide and strengthen all people in our common life to know the gifts of your grace and love. We especially lift up prayers of thanksgiving for our elementary school and the musical that you were able to put on for all those who were involved and continued to support our children and teachers. We also lift up prayers of thanksgiving for our praise band and the many ways they help us in worshiping you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For all other petitions and requests that this assembly raises on this day in their hearts and minds, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We give thanks for the saints who have gone before us asking that our gratitude for their witness be apparent in all that we do. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. May all that we ask and all that you see is needed in our world be given to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we will have our prayer response using hymn number 204 in your hymnals, Emmanuel, Emmanuel.
If you would please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination as printed in your bulletins. Your word, holy God, was written for our instruction. By your Holy Spirit, open our ears and fill us with the mysteries of your ancient love. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. We will now continue with our Advent meditation and I invite you to turn to your handout. This morning our hymn of focus is Angels from the Realms of Glory by James Montgomery from 1816. Again, I will be reading the lyrics to you and I invite you to, to really listen to what these words are saying. There are times that when we sing songs that are very familiar to us, we, we just kind of fall into the habit of singing them and we don't always listen really closely to what words we're actually singing. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, Worship Christ, the newborn King. Shepherds in the field abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with man is now residing. Yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. Sages, leave your contemplations. Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen his natal star. Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn king. And our reading this morning, some say that Moravian hymn writer James Montgomery who penned more than 400 songs, rivaled, James, rivaled Charles Wesley and Isaac Watts in skill. This, his best known work, has been heralded as a masterpiece. One observer even argued that for comprehensiveness, appropriateness of expression, force, and elevation of sentiment, it may challenge comparison with any hymn that was ever written in any language or country. While that may or may not be true, it has certainly become a holiday favorite. Though much could be said for the content of the descriptive lyrics, the simple refrain clearly reflects the essence of the Christmas message, the invitation to worship, which was accorded by the angels, shepherds, and sages, continues to issue forth. This call is as urgent and open today as it was 2,000 years ago. No longer a newborn, the risen Christ is all the more worthy of our praise. What an honor we have, the privilege of bowing down before the King of Kings. Let these verses lead you into his presence so that you may know and experience the joy and delight of worship. From Psalm 29, 1 through 2. Give honor to the Lord, you angels. Give honor to the Lord for his glory and strength. Give honor to the Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 5, 7. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. With deepest awe, I will worship at your temple. Psalm 66, 1 through 4. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of his name. Tell the world how glorious he is. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Your enemies cringe before your mighty power. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. And now, if you'll join me in our prayer, 
We humble ourselves before your awesome presence, O Lord. Search our hearts that they may be pure before you. Our desire this day is to respond to the call that sounds from your holy throne, the invitation which forever resonates through all heaven and earth. We bow before you, living God. We come that we might worship Jesus. Amen. And now um, we're going to sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. It's on page 220 in the Red Hymnal. And if you feel like standing, go ahead. If you feel like sitting, just stay seated. It's up to you. Our scripture reading this morning can be found on page 957 in the uh, Bibles in the pews. Uh, we are in the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verses 1 through 12. Uh, the Bibles in the pews are the NIV translation. I will be reading from the Common English Bible translation. This section of text often carries a header, Ministry of John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the desert of Judea, announcing, Change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. He was the one of whom Isaiah the prophet spoke when he said, The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem throughout Judea and all around the Jordan River came to him. As they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. Many Pharisees and Sadducees came to be baptized by John. He said to them, You children of snakes, who warned you to escape from the angry judgment that is coming soon? Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and lives. And don't even think about saying to yourselves, Abraham is our father. I tell you that God is able to raise up Abraham's children from these stones. The ax is ready at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be chopped down and tossed into the fire. I baptize with water those of you who have changed your hearts and lives. 
The one who is coming after me is stronger than I am. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out his threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husks with a fire that cannot be put out. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you will please join me in an attitude of prayer. God of action, you call us into the work of ministry in this world. You call us to not become spectators and instead to be active in acts that are repentance worthy and those that will bear fruit. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and minds to direct us towards these actions and this work you would have us do that impacts this world and impacts your hopes for us and the world. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God's blessings to you all and good morning once again on this second Sunday of Advent, a season of anticipation and wonder. I have a feeling the Purdue fans are still lost in wonder. Sorry, I got to take the shot when I can. Last week, we began our Advent sermon series, Waiting Well, that, that aims to help us better understand how Advent it offers us a lesson in waiting and also in knowing when to act. This series is going to carry us through Christmas Eve, and I, I hope that you're able to catch each week's message. If you are unable to join us in person, please remember that videos of our worship service are available online as well. Now, last week we used a message titled, Quick, Look Busy, where we talked about how easily we can get just kind of sucked into the busyness and the busy work that, that we believe is important and all too often, we neglect the work that God would have us do. Things like loving our God and our neighbors, sharing the gospel through living out our faith authentically, and making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. <clears throat> In that message, I also pointed out how, how hard waiting can be for us sometimes, and how when we're made to wait... We can often in interpret that as, as malice towards us or, or even have this per perception of incompetence of those who are making us wait. We're going to try to challenge the negative assumptions about waiting, that these meanings that it often carries of meanings of like inaction or apathy or a lack of passion. And we're going to try to work towards seeing waiting as something that can be deliberate, disciplined, and just. And just as I said last week, I do truly believe in the depths of my very being that learning to wait well is a spiritual discipline. And it's one that contributes directly to our emotional health, our spiritual vitality, and it leads us to actions that are grounded in faith. So let's dive back into our reading from the Gospel of Matthew as we journey through this week's message, Not All Actions Are Created Equal. Now, as direct and matter-of-fact as Mark's Gospel tends to be, Matthew doesn't always hold back either. Yes, Matthew does tend to use more repetition and, and poetic language at times, but the lessons and the messages that he shares are no less impactful or direct when they come from the mouth of Jesus, especially when those messages are directed at the disciples or, or people of authority in society. So after last week's challenge of not falling into the traps of perceived productivity and busyness, it's not really a big surprise to find Matthew coming back with this new challenge, a challenge to bear fruit. And not just any fruit, mind you, 
Not in this case, no. It is a challenge to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Jeez, Matthew's not playing around on this one. You know, during this season of anticipation and waiting, we are reminded that waiting is, it's not about an action, as I said earlier. Instead, we're reminded that waiting is about discerning the action that has meaning and actually changes the world. No pressure. Just got to change the world. Just bear fruit worthy of repentance and correctly discern what action or actions to undertake that actually change the world. Everybody got that? Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? You can check that off the list. But, but what are those things? What fruit can we bear that is worthy of repentance? Like, can we get a couple examples here, Matthew? At least some hints, anything? To be honest, I, I truly loathe trying to make a list of those actions that would qualify as repentance worthy, as if we don't have enough to stress over and disagree about right now. And who has the time? I know Matthew could not see into the future, or at least there's nothing to indicate that he could, but this is a really busy time of year. Can we just worry about this, you know, next year, maybe? Well, in theory, we could wait. It is a season of waiting and anticipation. However, we are being challenged right here, right now, to do this work. We are being challenged to both determine the repentance worthiness of what we do and to decide what actions we are called to take in the first place. If you think about it in light of last week's message, this work is similar to discerning what work is, is the busy work and what work is what God would have us do. You see, repentance and faithful living are about much, much more than just sin avoidance. That is part of it, but not the whole of it. There are sins of omission when we fail to act in ways that God is calling us to. And there are different types of sin, if you want to get technical about it. You can easily point to the seven deadly sins of pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. Or we could look at sadia from the Latin word meaning without care, which is the neglect to take care of something that one should. It's also translated as apathetic listlessness or depression without joy. Although I kind of feel like saying depression without joy is repetitive. Or how about vainglory? That's a fun new word. It's from the Latin word meaning unjustified boasting. Pope Gregory from the late 500 and early 600s viewed vainglory as a form of pride and, and he folded it into pride. Thomas Aquinas, a Italian Dominican friar and priest from the 1200s, he saw vainglory as the prognigator or pre, uh, predecessor of envy. Or we could look at some uh, look at what some Christians call the unforgivable sin, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Actually, let's not get into that one today. I think that's a whole sermon all on its own for another time. But even as we consider these, these types of sins, we must always keep in the forefront of our hearts and minds that we have forgiveness in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that secured our salvation through unconditional grace. We remember grace. Grace is a big part of our doctrine and theology as United Methodists. It is in others too, but I feel like we can kind of say it's really at the very core 
of our beliefs and our theological understandings, even when they're not always in agreement between all of us. And I want to point out that there are always some slippery slopes with any argument, but when it comes to sin and grace, who gets it and why, I feel the need to maybe set the record straight, if for no other reason than to make sure we're all on the same page. It can become incredibly problematic to get into the work of ranking sins. It can be easy to see why we might believe the sin of, of say, stealing is not as bad as, say, the sin of murder. Our laws typically indicate this to be true. But we need to differentiate between secular and spiritual repercussions and response to sin in the world. Another example might be how pride is often considered an invisible sin because at least it appears to not do as much harm as, say, a physical assault on someone. But again, a court of law would certainly see these offenses very differently. However, our need for spiritual repentance goes beyond any criminal code that we may adhere to. And then on top of all of this, we have many Christians who will tell you that that God sees all sins the same. Anything that pulls us farther away from God and from becoming the people that God intends us to be is seen as, as equally bad. And I know that this concept can be hard. It can be hard for some people who have been the victim of others' sins and people who very much feel a difference between sins, whether the sins they themselves have committed or have been committed against them. So what must we do, or sorry, so what we must then do is unpack this idea of repentance-worthy or the idea that our actions in faith are truly about turning away from sin and narrowing the space between our actions and God's hopes. Does the living of my faith result in my moving closer to God? Am I resting on the laurels of past successes? Or am I engaging in acts that result in widening the division between God and humanity? Are there things going on in this world where the need for human unity, as in comfort and not rocking the boat, is it working against what may bring us closer to God? I think we could all come up with, with several examples of things that, that we have done that have moved us closer to God. And I think we probably can all can think of several things that we have done that have pulled us farther away from God. Is letting individuals and families remain homeless when we have more than enough homes and safe dwelling places in this country to give every single homeless person or family a home, is that bringing us closer to God? Or is leaving our fellow siblings in Christ to freeze outside and, and fight just to survive to another wretched day, something that brings us closer to God? Does telling someone who is hungry to just go get a job, something that pulls us away from God and God's hopes? Or is feeding those who are hungry and in need of something that pulls us away from God and God's hope? is trying to dictate who can and cannot be in the church or a part of the church's ministry or even just being seen as another human person are those things that pull us away from God. 
is widening the circle, building a longer table, actually practicing and living our tagline of open hearts, open minds, open doors, are those the things that narrow the space between our actions and God's hopes? Is loving God and loving our neighbor something that pulls us away or brings us closer to God and God's hopes? Now, some of those may seem to have obvious answers, but I can assure you that there has been a time, and in some places it still is a time, when the answers were not so clear. A time when the answers that we would hope to hear as those who claim a faith in an all-loving God are not what we would hear being taught and practiced. In truth, we need to call out situations that demand our response and our reactions. We need to challenge the status quo and the norms of our world and society when it comes to how people are treated. Because even in this season of waiting, if we fail to acknowledge that our faith must actually impact the world, then all we're doing is further contributing to the brokenness. We only further contribute to the divide between us and God that we claim we want to heal and narrow Kind of like the saying that goes, we need to put our money where our mouth is and not stand idly by expecting someone or something else to do it for us. This is a season of anticipation, of waiting, but it is also a season of action. The shepherds were called into action and went and found the baby laying in the manger. Joseph was called into action to take Mary, to not divorce her, to go to Bethlehem. And Mary was called to possibly one of the greatest actions, to be the mother of a child that would change this world beyond anything anyone then and even now could fully expect or understand. And yet, all those examples also involved waiting. So this season can kind of feel like a contradiction at times. Are we waiting or are we acting? The answer is yes. I think though for us to act in the ways that God would hope us to, we also have to listen. Amen. I invite you to turn to pages 15 and 16 in your hymnals as we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right to our thanks and grace. it is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Has someone gone to let Sunday school know? Okay, thank you. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send empty away. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. In the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, and what that means is that this table doesn't belong to me to this church, to our denomination. This table belongs to Jesus Christ and he alone. And Jesus has welcomed everyone. You don't need to be a member of this church or a Methodist or a member of any other denomination. It doesn't matter your age, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation or identity, your mental or physical ability, your, your social standing, whether you're rich or poor, young or old, baptized or unbaptized. All those ways that we, we try to divide ourselves, those boxes that we cram people into, that's not what he sees. Jesus looks out and sees beloved children of God, all equal and worthy of love and grace and mercy. All he asks when you come forward is to do so with an open heart. This morning we will continue to celebrate the great Thanksgiving as we have for the past few months. Uh, you will be dismissed in your rows, come forward, put a, uh, your piece of bread will be placed in your hands and there will be cups of juice or wine that you can choose from. 
You can then choose to take your elements uh, one after the other, bread and then the juice, or you can dip your bread in your juice or wine um, and then take it as a whole. Doesn't matter. They're both equal and worthy in God's eyes. Brothers and sisters, this table has been set. The feast is prepared. Come and taste that God is good. broken for you.
Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would rise as you are able for our closing hymn number 213, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. Beloved siblings, in the coming Christ, may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.